Let's take a deeper dive into how Kamala Harris replacing Joe Biden as the presumptive Democratic presidential nominee has completely upended this race. It's now been uh, almost two weeks since Joe Biden dropped out, endorsed Kamala Harris, who secured enough delegate endorsements to become the presumptive nominee, also raising record amounts of money, $200 million in the first week of her campaign. Importantly, two thirds of which came from first time donors, meaning people who were not previously donors to Joe Biden. Harris also raised eighty one million dollars the day after Joe Biden announced his decision. That's the highest 24 hour fundraising hall of any presidential candidate in history. And in a sense, Kamala Harris has revitalized the Democratic Party. The momentum behind Harris is real and it's a real contrast to Joe Biden, who two thirds of Democrats wanted to see drop out of the race. But the question is, can Kamala Harris maintain her momentum? And maybe more importantly, can she defeat Donald Trump in November? So far, the answer is not totally clear. Let's start with how Joe Biden was polling against Trump prior to exiting the race. Then we'll look at Kamala's early polling. According to the Real Clear Politics average, as of July 16th, Biden was losing every critical swing state that delivered him victory in 2020, losing Arizona by 5.8, losing Georgia by 3.8, losing Wisconsin by 2.9 losing Michigan by 2.1, losing Nevada by 5%, losing Pennsylvania by 3.8. Given that the Electoral College exists, we have to remember that swing state polling is a really important indicator of who's likely to win the election in November. In every swing state where Biden was losing to Trump, the same polling shows down ballot Senate candidates defeating their MAGA opponents by substantial margins. This includes Ruben Gallego, Jackie Rosen, Tammy Baldwin. When I reported on this in an editorial, many in the audience were upset with me, saying the polls are all wrong and Biden is actually ahead. But apparently the polling was convincing enough to Biden himself, because as Politico reports on the eve of his decision to exit the race, Joe Biden's aides showed him internal polling which showed his lead collapsing in the swing states, also in New Mexico and Virginia. So where does this leave Kamala Harris today? Well, the polling on Kamala versus Trump is limited. Her campaign just started, but there are some early indicators that we can look at. Remember that Kamala's fundraising has been incredible, literally record breaking, and that serves as an important proxy to enthusiasm. But before dropping out of the race, Joe Biden's approval was one of the lowest of his presidency at 38 percent. According to 538, as of July 30th, Kamala's approval rating is not that much higher than Biden's at just 39.6. But in a morning consult poll conducted more recently, Kamala Harris has 50 percent favorability. That's much better. At this point in her campaign, Kamala's fundraising may be a stronger barometer of her favorability than what 538 or morning consults say, but this is still subject to change. But what about the swing states we reviewed earlier? The reason swing state polling matters is a candidate can win the popular vote, but lose the Electoral College, which often depends on just a handful of critical swing states. Now, the swing state polling looks much better for Kamala Harris than it did for Joe Biden. According to the Real Clear Politics average, as of July 28th, Kamala Harris has gained ground in all of the swing states where Biden was losing to Trump. In Arizona, Trump is ahead by about four, down from about six. In Georgia, Trump is ahead by 3.6 instead of 3.8. In Wisconsin, Trump is ahead by just 0.2 percent, down from almost 3 percent. In Michigan, Kamala Harris is now leading by two, where Trump led Biden by two. In Nevada, Trump's ahead by four, down from five. And in Pennsylvania, Trump is ahead by 2.7, down from 3.8. Some of the polls included in these Real Clear Politics averages were actually conducted prior to Joe Biden dropping out. So, if anything, these are conservative estimates of where Kamala currently stands in this matchup against Donald Trump. Now, additionally, you can find more recent individual polls that are more optimistic for Harris. We've talked about some of them. According to a Bloomberg morning consult poll done from July 24 to 28, Kamala is leading Trump in Michigan by 11 and leading by two in Arizona, Wisconsin and Nevada. Trump is ahead of Harris by four in Pennsylvania 
and two in North Carolina and Georgia is a toss up. We also have polling from Emerson conducted between July 22nd and 23rd, which finds Trump is still ahead in Arizona by five ahead in Georgia by two, Michigan by one and Pennsylvania by two with Wisconsin as a toss up. So the takeaway is Kamala Harris's campaign has only just started and the numbers show at minimum Harris is competitive and has the potential to gain even more ground after the DNC and after debates, if there are any, if Trump agrees to debate her. So let's now talk about the specific path to victory for Kamala Harris. There are actually a few paths electorally which could deliver Kamala Harris the 270 electoral votes she needs to become president. The first and most likely path would be to win Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. We're putting up the map of what that would look like if Kamala Harris wins Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania, but loses Nevada, Arizona, Georgia and North Carolina. It's a razor thin margin, but she would win the presidency and defeat Donald Trump. Now, there's a second path to victory, which is called the Sun Belt path, where Kamala wins Nevada, Arizona, Georgia and North Carolina. Here's what the map would look like in that circumstance. And based on what we're seeing in the polling today, it's unlikely that Kamala will lose all three states, Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. But the point is, even if she does, there is still a path to the presidency for her. Now, a third path for Kamala Harris is winning Wisconsin, Michigan, Georgia and North Carolina, but losing Arizona, Nevada and Pennsylvania. Here's the map in that scenario. And then a very interesting scenario that could come up if Kamala wins Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, but loses Arizona, Nevada, Georgia and the Omaha district in Nebraska is a 269 269 tie. Now, this is not a good scenario for Kamala Harris, because in this scenario, there would be a contingent election in the House where Trump almost certainly wins because Republicans almost always have more House delegations. That makes it a scary scenario and it just reinforces the importance of winning that Omaha district in Nebraska. Here's what the map would look like in those circumstances. So the main takeaway here is that Kamala Harris has multiple paths to victory, whereas based on what the polling told us about President Biden, he needed to win Michigan. Wisconsin and Pennsylvania to get a second term because he seemed so far behind in Georgia, North Carolina, Arizona and Nevada. So there are also other early indicators that Kamala Harris is a formidable opponent to Donald Trump. There's a Fox News poll conducted July 22nd to 24th, which finds that Kamala Harris's approval rating has surpassed Trump's in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and Minnesota. That's a good sign. According to ABC News Ipsos polling, Democrats are now more enthusiastic about Kamala Harris than Republicans currently are about Trump. You might recall that previously Republicans were more excited about Trump than Democrats were about Biden. That's an optimistic change. And then there's a CNN survey that shows Harris with a four point lead over Trump among registered voters 18 to 34. That's an 11 point improvement compared to Joe Biden. There's also an Axios poll finding that Kamala Harris is more popular with voters 18 to 34 than Biden was and that they are even more likely to vote for her. So these are promising signs for Kamala Harris. But even though she seems to have the momentum, it's very much unclear who's going to win. Trump could very well win a second term. This will almost certainly be a close race. We should not get complacent. Even Kamala herself has acknowledged she's the underdog in this race, and that's probably true. Even if the polling showed Kamala Harris winning every single swing state by a wide margin, which it does not, it does not show that. But even if it did, we should still behave as if Kamala Harris were behind and we should be campaigning and acting accordingly. It's great that the data suggest Harris has improved relations with that 18 to 34 demographic, but 
the Harris campaign should not take those votes for granted, especially when it comes to policy. Kamala Harris should run on at least two to three bold, popular, progressive policies and viciously go after Donald Trump. Her rhetoric on Trump has been very strong. She's open speeches and rallies saying she's seen Donald Trump's type because she spent so long prosecuting criminals and fraudsters and sexual predators. The contrast between the prosecutor and the convicted felon is a striking contrast, and it also neutralizes the Republican attack on Democrats as being soft on crime, which Republicans love to play up. Trump represents the threat to democracy and the Harris campaign needs to offer something for people to vote for, not just vote against Trump. And so far, Kamala Harris, as of this moment, does not have any policies listed on her website. But in listening to her speeches and rallies, it's clear she will make reproductive freedom a central campaign issue. That's good, but it should be expanded. The policy discussion should go beyond that. Talk about legislation that she co-sponsored as a senator. For example, Harris co-sponsored Bernie Sanders free college legislation. Harris co-sponsored the Green New Deal legislation with AOC. And as a presidential candidate in 2020, she pitched this $10 trillion climate plan whose public and private investments would have dwarfed the $1.6 trillion estimated cost of Biden's major climate, energy, infrastructure and tech legislation. As a senator, Harris proposed sweeping tax cuts for the middle class through the Lift Act, which would have provided an annual tax credit of up to three thousand dollars per person or six thousand dollars per couple for lower and middle income workers on top of any benefits they already receive. So these are just a few ideas that could appeal to progressives. We should not underestimate Trump. He can absolutely win a second term and we should do everything we can to prevent that from happening. But we also shouldn't underestimate Kamala Harris, she can absolutely win this as well. When she first ran for president in 2020, polling for her peaked at 15 percent after the first primary debate, which was impressive for a relatively less known politician in the same race as established figures like Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. But you might recall that her polling slipped when she went moderate, when she dropped her support for Medicare for all when she dropped the other flagship progressive policies. So if her 2020 campaign is an indication of how she can win 2024, she should position herself to the left of Joe Biden, but to the right of Bernie Sanders. This is not saying what are my politics? This is saying strategically what positioning makes the most sense. Now, there are still three months to go until the election. That's a very long time in politics. A lot will happen between now and then. Kamala's running mate, the DNC, maybe debating Trump. All of these are opportunities for Kamala Harris to improve swing state polling even more. The attacks on Kamala from Republicans so far have fallen pretty flat. They've tried attacking her for her laugh, laugh, laugh in Kamala, the cackle. It hasn't really worked in Trump's favor. It's really only highlighted that Trump rarely laughs and doesn't seem to understand humor. If anything, it's human humanized uh, Kamala Harris. They've tried attacking Kamala Harris's handling of the border, probably more effective than making fun of her laugh, but also weak in light of the fact that Trump blocked the Biden administration and Congress from passing a bipartisan border bill, which would have restored remain in Mexico and much of what Trump advocates for. So based on everything we've seen so far, It looks like making Kamala Harris the nominee rather than Joe Biden has been the right call. We don't have all of the information, including November's results, but polling, fundraising, the implosion of Trump's attacks on the Democrat presumptive Democratic nominee. All of these are positively pointing signs. Now what we need to do is vote, donate if we can, phone bank if we can and see what happens in November.